Okay, okay. I know some people have read the title and want to banish me to the anti-science realm. But before you do, please hear me out on this. Because, and this will sound really controversial, this is the theory that I personally believe is the closest to what really destroyed the Chernobyl Unit 4 reactor. It's a theory that is surprisingly backed very heavily by science, and is now going through a wave of support among Russian and Ukrainian scientists. Before we properly go through this theory, we need to first learn about nuclear fizzle. For those of you who have never learned about this rare event in nuclear bomb explosions, a nuclear fizzle is when a nuclear explosion effectively fails, due to a poor design. The energy released in a nuclear bomb comes from a very intense, short period of criticality of nuclear fission or fusion. For that, the material itself needs to be close together for that period of time. If it is instead dispersed too early, then the maximum potential of the bomb is not reached, and what should be a very large explosion is in fact tiny and quite embarrassing for the scientists that built the bomb. So, back to Chernobyl. It's very rare for me to describe the actual damage the reactor suffered in the last few seconds, simply for how violent it is. This is the structure of Unit 4 before the explosion, and this is the same structure afterwards. Not only was the upper biological shield thrown upwards, but at some point the lower biological shield, the bottom cap of the reactor, was forced downwards, and one third of it was melted through completely. Between 1987 and 1992, Years were spent drilling slowly through the side of the core to examine inside for the remains of fuel rods, to determine if criticality was possible. As you can see on the diagrams and in the video, it's empty. Somehow all of the core was ejected from Unit 4, except for a few pieces of graphite and some concrete panels that fell in from above while the Elena was airborne. And what's interesting is that the core had to be fully empty before Elena came down, because those concrete blocks are resting between it and the lower biological shield, which also logically means the lower biological shield also had to be pushed down, or else the concrete panels won't fit. If the lower biological shield collapsed later, the concrete panels would have almost certainly fallen over, not get trapped between the two shields. Also, if it collapsed later, then the fuel would still have to remain in the shield, and would melt the concrete. Some people have proposed that the remaining fuel merged together in a distinct pool, but how? You see what I mean, right? That explosion was crazy violent, but it gets crazier. As you can see, the lower biological shield has a very smooth vertical cut straight down the southeastern third of the structure. The fact it is a clean 90 degree cut to the lower biological shield, which is today on an angle, would imply that the cut through was made before the shield was pushed down which also means before the core exploded. The temperatures at the bottom of the core, therefore, were hot enough to melt through a 2 meter thick layer of steel in seconds. It's unbelievable. You wouldn't get such stories in fiction, and yet the evidence seems to be undeniable. And even crazier, what if I told you that part of the core was in fact torn out from inside of it? The big sheet of metal on the far side of the reactor core is in fact the inner lining of the reactor, most of which was thrown up at the same time Yelena was flung upwards, and the rest is still lying inside the core. So, the core was destroyed to the point of literal emptiness almost, 
But this leaves a big question. Where did the fuel go? Konstantin Chechorov, the lead scientist exploring inside the sarcophagus of Unit 4, claims they were only able to identify roughly 4-6% of the nuclear fuel that was still in the core. Now, let's assume conservatively that he's wrong and severely underestimated the amount of fuel underneath the reactor, and there's actually 20% of it still left in the building. Here's a question. Where did 80% of the core go? It cannot be accounted for outside the building. Radiation levels are way too low for that to be the case. So where is it? Enter a random laboratory in Leningrad that was conducting aerial flights over a factory in Sharapovets to measure the noble gas emissions of a factory producing liquid oxygen and liquid nitrogen. As it turns out, on April 29th, the day the cloud of emissions passed over Sharapovets, there was an extremely high concentration of xenon-133, a byproduct of nuclear fission, with a half-life of five days. Except it was at three to five kilometers altitude, much higher than the cloud of radiation that we all know about. In other words, the cloud passing over Sharapovets cannot be from it. It came from the initial explosion. And the cloud was full of still fissioning uranium. And with that, the nuclear fizzle comes to Chernobyl. But before we can look at how nuclear fizzle may have occurred at Chernobyl, we need to look at this absolutely disgusting image. This is the seismic data at Norinsk, approximately 100 kilometers away from the nuclear power plant. While this data might be difficult to understand, we can see two things here, those being the two seismic marks for the two explosions, a little under three seconds apart. What's interesting is that when we look at the envelope line, the line of energy measured by the seismographs, we see a double humped explosion, compared to conventional explosions at quarries a similar distance away. The first explosion was not one, but two. This corroborates with what witnesses in the building report, hearing two explosions followed by a third and final larger explosion higher up in the core. It is very difficult if not impossible, to explain the double explosion, in any conventional means. Something happened in the core twice in very quick succession in a similar region, followed by the larger explosion that blew the building apart. The final piece of evidence I want to mention before detailing this theory is the structure of the debris pattern. Have you ever found it unusual that the explosion is directed forwards and backwards, instead of to the side. In fact, it's so specifically north and south that it directly lines up with the reactor hull on the north side. Parts of the floor adjacent are still standing. But if you look on the south side of the building, the damage pattern actually extends over a bit, closer to the vent block and the vent tower. It's not lining up with the reactor hull, it's lining up with the intake vents on the north and south sides of the building. If we look on the western side of the building, we also see the ventilation has been blown out. Now, what could have been the cause of a sudden rush of stuff through the vents to blow them out? Steam, of course. The same steam that flooded the building and made navigation inside impossible. But if the steam destroyed the building, then it cannot be the cause of the first explosion, as in the smaller ones at the bottom of the core. And so, we can now finally examine the theory. At the bottom of the reactor, when the runaway began, there were a series of local areas of greater reactivity. In Chernobyl Unit 4, according to recovered data, 
this was in the southeast portion of the core. And here, the energy released was a lot more extreme than the rest of the core. Here, we're talking temperatures of up to 10,000 degrees Celsius, and pressures of up to 3,000 atmospheres. As was already covered in my How Chernobyl Exploded series, go check it out if you haven't, the threshold of prompt criticality was exceeded as much as five times over. But what this theory specifies is that at least two channels turned into effectively very inefficient nuclear bombs. As we all know, the RBMK uses lowly enriched nuclear fuel, and when these prompt critical nuclear explosions happen, the fuel is dispersed. For example, the nuclear bomb dropped over Hiroshima used 64 kilograms of uranium, enriched to 80% uranium-235. Only 0.7 grams of it fissioned before all of the fuel was dispersed and the fission excursion was stopped. Applying the same logic to Chernobyl, any prompt critical bomb-like explosion would immediately terminate when the fuel is dispersed. How does it disperse? The energy is released outwards and through the metal lower biological shield, melting away the structure. It also goes upwards though, through the upper biological shield, spitting out a lot of nuclear fuel. The very fuel that will be found over Sheropovets, decayed into xenon. Today, a large area of missing fuel bundles attached to Yelena exists in this region today. It's also worth pointing out here that many witnesses saw a blue flash over the building before the explosion occurred. While we obviously cannot confirm what this is, it is definitely possible that this was a large amount of nuclear fuel still fissioning, escaping the building. And with the pressure release, we reach the final nail in the coffin of the Chernobyl disaster. This initial release of pressure. The main circulation pumps rebound, having been closed off due to the increase in pressure. Water enters the bottom of the core through the now open stop check valves, at a high force, instantly heating from 270 to 10,000 degrees Celsius. Roughly speaking, water expands in volume 1,600 times, just turning from water to steam. And we know that approximately 12 tons, or 12 cubic meters, of water entered the core in the last second of the explosion. So, at minimum, not including the expansion of steam from the boiling point to 10,000 degrees Celsius, at least 19,200 cubic meters of steam was produced. And this is what blew the building apart. Not only did it manage to throw the upper biological shield off, but as it was directed out of the emergency steam discharge, it also found its way at high force into the ventilation system, blowing straight through these weaker structures at force, bringing the entire building down from the top. The much smaller vents on the side of the building were not structurally significant points, and so the building didn't collapse on the western side. And that's about it, in summary. The reactor ran away so hard, the fuel exploded like a fission bomb, but was dispersed so quickly that the low enriched uranium could not reach its maximum potential. The fission was terminated immediately, blowing a hole through the reactor, above and below. The release of pressure caused a sudden influx of steam that throws Yelena upwards and blows the building apart. The force of the first explosion is what pulverized the inside of the reactor, in such a violent nature. It was then the steam explosion that dispersed it around the local area. It's the theory I believe best fits the evidence, and I am curious if I have convinced any of you. But, as I will say, keep your minds open and do your own research.
learning is important. And who knows what you will find.